We're very busy in both of the rooms, which is fantastic, and we've got some record numbers joining us uh, all over the world online today as well. So thank you very much indeed for, uh, for joining us today. And this is our Sustainable Transport Forum, EV and Mobility. We've got a fantastic panel for you today. Uh, starting on the far side, we have Martin Kochman, VP Customers and Industries at Itachi Vitara. We have Sam Clark, Chief Vehicle Officer at GridServe, and we have Peter Gallagher closest to me here, Commercial Director at Extreme E. So we can have a nice warm welcome for our panel, please. Okay, we'll get to uh, the audience questions at the end in the last 10 minutes as ever. You know the drill by now. Uh, but, uh, well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us on this. We've got a lot to, to cover off. Um, but we'll start off with a, a fairly straightforward one. I will class this one as an underarm question. Um, when it comes to meeting climate targets, how big a piece of the jigsaw do you feel EVs are? Martin, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, well, they're clearly a, a, a part of the jigsaw. Um, <laughs> And I suppose it also depends what targets we're, we're talking about. Um, uh, so I, I think um, in terms of where we will meet certain targets, EVs will play a role. So within metropolitan areas, I'm pretty sure that EVs will be a, a significant force, as it were. Uh, perhaps outside of metropolitan areas, less so. Um, when we're dealing with categories of um, uh, uh, user, then I think, again, EVs, when it comes to commercial fleets in particular, will probably play a significant role, possibly less so for domestic users, at least for the, for the time being. So I think it very much depends on you know, which targets we're talking about, but, but they do clearly play you know, a, sing a significant role. Um, and we need to kind of work out how to optimise that, I guess. Well, well speaking of optimising, yeah. I did want to, uh, <laughs> to get into the uh, Optimise Prime project that you guys were involved in, just yes. to make sure everyone's aware of it, because it's, it's a key part of the, of the discussion today and, and your contribution to it. For anyone who hasn't heard about it, who isn't aware what it was, is, could you, could you fill us in on that? Uh, yeah, happy to do that. So um, Optimise Prime was a project uh, which Hitachi led, but was really a consortium uh, effort. Uh, so uh, UK government... Her Majesty's Government, as it then was back in 2018, provided the money. Um, we had three um, uh, major organisations providing the, the fleets. Um, so that was uh, Royal Mail, British Gas and Uber. Um, and we did the, if you like, the ingestion and manipulation analysis of data. And the idea uh, was to try to, um, to run a trial of electric vehicles, commercial electric vehicles, to understand how best to accelerate the adoption um, of EVs for that category uh, of user. Um, program started in 2018, uh, finished in March of this year. I think we set out with a target of something like 2,000 EVs we needed to have in the, uh, in the trial to make it worthwhile. We ended up with 6,000 vehicles um, enrolled. Um, and I think we came up with some interesting conclusions, uh, both in terms of the, 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 finance, the business case, if you will, uh, for commercial EVs, uh, but also you know, considerations around operability, infrastructure, uh, so on and so forth. Um, there's a, I think we created one of the world's, if not the world's largest data set uh, for commercial uh, electric vehicles. Uh, that's all in the public domain, so um, Her Majesty, in addition to, uh, to paying for the whole enterprise, has also made everything public. So if you Google Optimize Prime, if you're interested, you can have access to the data set. You can also have access to all of the formal deliverables that came out of the, the back end of that and all of the conclusions. And there are, there are boring reports that take a long time to read, but also some kind of slightly sexier PowerPoint presentations to, to kind of help you uh, into that, as it were. So oh, Martin, you're a room of food people who love reports. I love sure. sexy <laughs> PowerPoints. Uh, uh, Sam, if I could come to you next about... Um, the, the role of, uh, of EVs and the size of the piece of the puzzle they, they play for you. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. That's very loud. Um, yeah, executive summaries are useful for those reports, aren't they? That I always find. Um, and by the way, Optimize Prime, I think, is the coolest name of a project I've come across so far. So um, It's well, very nearly a transformer. Yeah, that's, it's, really, it's really good. So well played for that. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a major, major, major part. And I think... Um, I think it was a few years ago now, but we were around 1% of, of EVs on the road, registered vehicles on the road. It's probably that 2 or 3% now. So um, in that context, it's a very small amount, but look how much we're talking about it and how much it's grown over that time. So um, when we get to the point where we're into the double digits of, of, um, of conversion of EVs on the roads, you know, whether that be cars, vans, trucks, whatever, it's going to make a tremendous difference. 
Um, so I keep reminding myself that you know we're, we're, it's only still a very very small market share, but it's growing all the time. So it's inevitably going to have a huge huge impact on uh, on climate change. You know? So there's a lot of work to do, but we're getting there. Yeah. Peter. Same question. Uh, good question. Uh, I do like the name as well. Well done. Thank you. Uh, I do think, you know, we talk about a lot about EVs, and uh, I come from the motorsport side, which is exciting in some ways. I'm not a driver. I'm more commercial. Uh, and um, we look at it going that EVs have a big role, and we'll talk to a lot of manufacturers, governments, about policy as well as regulation. And I think it's a massive um, kind of one thing about um, the system is the infrastructure, which needs to be changed in policy. But also from a cost point of view is that um, there needs to be more focus on costs in terms of manufacturing. And we talk about cars, but also about um, public transport. You might be kind of native to London or go around, but changing EVs and buses, but also mining as well. So the uh, infrastructure on construction is quite, quite key as well. So I look at going, you know, from the questions you've asked, it's talking about how, do, how does EVs play into that? It's not just cars. It's just thinking a little bit bigger than that uh, from, from an ecosystem point of view. Because what I wanted to move on to next was what is going to influence the adoption of EVs by consumers. I think every one of us in the room today can remember the first time someone on their, their street got an EV. And, oh, someone's doing well. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll start with, with you, Peter, on this one. I guess with the role of, of motorsport EV. Because I guess one of the historical questions was, well, is about performance, about the performance of EVs compared to traditional vehicles. Do you feel that that plays a big role in the influence? You've summarised that really well. Uh, it does play, play a massive uh, bit of impact. One thing from a, a marketing point of view, we see that uh, EVs are usually marketed as a kind of a facilitation of transport. Not fun, if you know what I mean. If you look at F1, for example, those uh, engines are extreme. They're 1.5, 1.6 litre engines, but they perform at a really high level. So actually the efficiencies that motorsport can, can, um, can give the EV market is great. And I think that uh, what the EV... Uh, uh, market needs to do is kind of grasp that emotional aspect of motorsports and put it into EVs to make the adoption seem more appealing from a, um, a demand side. Also from a supply side, I think that what, what is needed is that there is a shortage of lithium, there's a shortage of platinum, and uh, I think governments should work together a bit closer to, to make sure manufacturing still sticks and uh, enables people to actually buy them at a, at a, at a market rate and, uh, and push on through. Martin, Sam, what uh, do you feel is going to be that thing that influences the adoption of EVs by consumers? Shall I have a go first? Yeah, by all means. Um, so Optimise Prime is, a, is a, the world's largest channel of commercial EVs, so it's worth saying that many of the comments I make will be a little bit skewed towards commercial rather than domestic use. So there is an overlap, and even within the trial, given that many of the participants in the, dry, in the trial were Uber drivers, there's a little bit of a kind of crossover there, I suppose. Um, so there are lots of things that influence uh, people's decision to buy an EV, and some of them are very qualitative around you know, values and the, the kind of person that they think they are, that they want to project uh, into, into, the, into the world, how they view the world. In a commercial environment, that's also kind of true, but money does tend to play a much more prominent uh, part. Uh, and uh, among the conclusions from Optimize Prime was that actually the business case for EVs is pretty marginal in many cases, not in some. So if, for example, um, you're a private hire vehicle, an Uber driver, operating in central London, driving over 100 miles a day, then the business case is pretty good. Um, but in other circumstances, the business case might be influenced quite heavily by a number of factors. The congestion charge is one of the, the biggest ones. Um, may seem a little uh, counterintuitive, but other things being equal, uh, and I'm going to simplify the analysis uh, now, not least of all because that's the way I remember it, um, but it's all out there in the, uh, in the reports. Other things being equal, if you were driving an EV within a congestion charge zone um, versus outside of a congestion charge zone, it's about 10% cheaper than a conventional vehicle if you're driving your EV in a congestion charge zone where you have an exemption from the congestion charge, at least until 2025 in London on current plans, versus driving it outside, where it's actually 4% more expensive than driving a conventional vehicle. Again, other things being equal. So, so that's the, the, the way in which government and local government policy is implemented has a, has, has a, has a role to play. Uh, leasing costs, again, leasing costs for EVs significantly higher than for conventional vehicles. And so uh, to, to that, that plays a part. Uh, whether you're charging 
publicly or privately um, has a significant difference. So if, you're, if, if we take over an eight-year period, which was, which was the business case duration that we looked at, if you take the, the incremental costs of running a conventional vehicle at, at zero, then the costs of running an EV um, privately charged were £11,000 more over the eight-year period. And if it was all publicly charged, it was over £20,000 more expensive. So again, there are lots of you know, interesting nuances around uh, making the business case work. Among the, the more practical conclusions uh, of Optimize Prime were that you know, where you charge and how you charge and how quickly you charge and what tariff you pay for charging is a very material factor. So, so in, in practical terms, if you're able, I, I think we came up with some ghastly euphemism like flexibility solutions or something marketing people dreamt up. But if you're, if you're, if you're able to optimize the way in which you charge um, through a profiled connection that says, I'm simply not going to charge at this time of the day, and at this time of the day I'm going to charge like crazy, and at this time of the day kind of so-so, then that actually is a very material um, uh, factor in making the, the economics around uh, these kinds of vehicles more, uh, more attractive. But it is a, it's a complicated old thing to get your head around. Sam, and I guess GridServe play a huge role in what influences adoption, because if someone suddenly has a, a GridServe station suddenly set up near them, that's, that's a huge visual reminder to them, the fact that this is now a very viable option for them. Yeah, it certainly does now, I think, in the, in the, in the near term, because um, the, the, the phraseology everyone uses now is it's all about the charging infrastructure, or the charging infrastructure is not good enough, um, which it isn't, but it's improving at a dramatic pace. Um, and so, yeah, whether it be GridServe or, or some of the other mar CPOs, the chargement operators that are putting, you know, we ra we've just recently raised a half a billion pounds to, to, to accelerate the uptake and, uh, of, of EVs and, and put more infrastructure in the ground across most of the service stations across the UK so that um, people will be able to graze and charge conveniently and, and not too dissimilar from that of filling up with, with petrol. And, and when you start to change that mindset, I think I, I wrote an article recently where I, I came up with a phrase that, I, that says... Um, I don't stop to charge now. I, I charge because I've stopped. You know, it's a very different thing. So in years gone by, I've been driving EVs for over 20 years. I ran a log logistics company for 10 years with a fully electric fleet in London. And, you know, it was a challenge. It was difficult. It was nowhere to charge. Um, and, and, uh, and the range of the vehicles are very, very limited. In fact, some of my vans could only do 12 or 14 miles in its totality. That was as much as the range would do. Now, the, the landscape has changed immeasurably over the last five years. I feel like an old man just talking about these stories because they're, <laughs> they're, so, they're almost obsolete now because we've moved along. So well, it shows so the better. progress, doesn't it? It does, yeah, in a very short period of time. And I, I founded that company in 2009. You know, 10 years later, we were the you know, biggest, biggest fleet in the, in the country, fully electric. And, 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 and things have changed dramatically. And I guess those real-world examples are, are good indications of where we're going and, and, and what's going to happen next. But, um, but yeah, there's plenty. Of, there is enough power. There is enough lithium. It's not a. There is an abundance of lithium in the world. It's just getting it's extracting it, and getting hold of it, which is the main thing. But um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of myths to bust. There's a lot of I think I said last time we were on stage together. Um, there's a lot of myths to bust and a lot of um, misinformation that we've got to try and fight through. Um, but we'll get there and we will win. And uh, you know we'll be a better a better climate for it. I want to stay with those myths no. because that's <laughs> that's a, brought that up. That is a huge <laughs> influencer. Isn't it? Because as we touched on about performance, for example, yep. that was the myth that oh, my my EV, you know, an EV doesn't perform as well. Well, I, I know the first time my brother took me out on his Tesla, I, I would, would would happily disagree with that. Um, but you know, these myths need to be taken apart. How can all of you, from your different perspectives, help break those myths down? Uh, well, myth busting. Um, uh, again, I guess it depends on what the, what the myth is. <laughs> I, I think there is some truth, like, like in the, the, the ancient Greek myths, there is some truth to them, right? And mm -hmm. they, they need to be kind of handled with, handle with care. So um, certainly uh, through the Optimized Prime trial, uh, there were some categories of user where it was much easier to see how they were going to um, make their EV fleet successful. Um, so, for example, if they were... If, if they had a depot infrastructure of their own um, and they were relatively low mileage users, then that tended to make the whole enterprise more successful. So Royal Mail, for example, if you look at their vans and their depot infrastructure, which they're kind of blessed with historically, but their average van was doing between you know, 16 and 30 miles a day. So, you know, the, 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 the anxiety that there may have been about, you know, oh my God, am I going to make it to the next charge point? No, that, that, that simply didn't exist. Um, you know, is, is there going to be 
economically viable infrastructure for me to use in order to charge my vehicle? Well, yeah, there is. It's a depot. It's where it's where my vehicle lives, kind of thing. So, um, so that was that was um, pretty pretty straightforward to, to kind of bust any myths around, uh, you know, the distances or the availability of charging infrastructure. Um, if, however, you were you know, operating in a more mixed uh, economy of, you know, some, uh, you know, private charging and some public charging, then the whole business case became a little bit flakier. Particularly if your private charging was at home because then I think it is still the case that there isn't enough you know, at-home charging infrastructure uh, and there is difficulty in, in kind of rolling that out fast enough. So I think there probably is a little bit of truth to that myth, but I've spoken long enough about myths now and I'm going to hand <laughs> yeah. it over to colleagues. Yeah, I just think it, it's very difficult for us to, to fight against the sort of tabloid media and, and some, of the, some of the articles we see, which, you know, there was one recently from, from the Daily Fail, sorry, Mail, um, that, that showcased a vehicle that was, it rained a bit and, it got, and a car got stuck in some water and it was a write-off and, and electric vehicle, it said the headline was electric vehicles get written off in the floods. It was actually a seven-year-old diesel van with an electric gearbox, which, which <laughs> got destroyed and therefore written off. It had nothing to do with their EVs whatsoever. Um, to the point where we wrote to them and actually managed, managed to get the, the title changed. But it didn't matter. It was, it was, it's, it's just tomorrow's chip paper or whatever the expression is, right? So there's all sorts of things like that that we're fighting at the whole time where it's just misinformation that, that, that we've got to try and fight against and it's difficult. Um, you know, and, and as I said very, at the very beginning, things aren't perfect. We know that. The vehicle costs are coming down. Total cost of ownership is very, very important, so we can we can make sure people are aware of the fact that the, the, the capital cost of vehicles might be higher, but the running cost is so much lower. So you know you club those two things together, and you'll find that most electric vehicles are cheaper to run today than, than the diesel or the petrol equivalents. And it's that sort of rhetoric we're trying to get out, but it's often just battered away with the sort of Nigel Farage style rubbish that just gets straight across the the, the top headline. And, and we've got to, we've got to try and fight that somehow. Um, but the truth will out, you know, and, it, and we'll get there in the end. You know, I think I drove here from Cheltenham today where I live in the Cotswolds and, you know, it's uh, 150 miles, something, 120 miles, something like that. You know, I got here with 60% left. I can comfortably get home again this, this evening without even worrying about needing to charge. I might do if I want to stop, but I don't have to. You know, that's a complete seismic shift. I've gone right across the country and back again without, without much concern. You know, that, that was impossible just a few short years ago. So um, it definitely works. We're definitely able to utilize EVs on, on long distances now. And we just got to get that message across and, and fight fight the myths. Yeah, and the, the world motorsport and, and building on that ha has a big thing to play. I think you educate people and you publish data and we can happily say that uh, our, our, the performance of our cars is strong. It's really good. But there is, you know, room to grow. And I think one thing we were talking about internally is that uh, in the media, a lot of people see it's either petrol or electric. And it's not really the best way to look at it. And I think what we try to need to do is see it is this choice. Sometimes petrol is right, sometimes electric is right, but they can all exist in the same ecosystem. And I think if everybody had that uh, same view, then I think it'd be a better rounded conversation, a better choice for all consumers. Mm -hmm. And if we're wanting to bust some myths, a good way to do it is uh, sharing the video of this once it goes onto our YouTube. That was a shameless plug, wasn't it? I, I'm sorry, I'll take that one back. Um, let's move on to the um, a, a recurring theme of today and that is the role of, of governments and policy makers it's the it's the carrot and the stick sort of scenario isn't it how big a role do you all feel that that governments and policy makers have in helping with the transition towards ev uh, dominated transport what role do you feel they play so, go first you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, massive, obviously. Um, you know, we, we need we need carrots and we need sticks i think in all all, all economic scenarios um, uh, but the, definitely the carrots need to be there. But I think the clarity of said carrots is the most important thing for me. There's, there's an awful lot of, um, of information out there about, about what opportunities there are, what grant funding is available or, or, or what the government is doing. Um, but often it's quite disparate and it's quite misleading in the sense that, that things change all the time and, you know, as does prime ministers um, over the last few years. And, and that has a knock trickle effect, trickle or knock knockdown effect of, of information not being as, as clear and, um, for, the, for the general public. So... Um, I think we need carrots and we need sticks. There's definitely um, an element of incentivizing all the different facets, whether that be green recovery funds to support infrastructure or incentives for, for the purchase of, of vehicles at the other end on the consumer market. We need all of these things. They do need to taper off um, because they, 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 the market needs to look after itself. Um, but it needs to be a blend, and that blend needs needs to be transparent, so we can actually see what's coming down the track, and we can and, and we as an industry, but also as consumers, can make informed decisions on the basis of, of some some degree of structure. Whereas at the moment, it's a, it's a little bit blurry. Yeah, fair point. I think uh, you said everything. I think the only thing I'd layer up is saying that uh, 
a lot of policy and government makers talk about moving to a carbon neutral society in 2040 or 2050. I would kind of want to see them just accelerate that a bit further. Uh, I, I think a lot of people at the moment see it as a cost and as t things develop, it'll get cheaper economies of scale. And I think governments have a role to quicken that up quicker than they actually say. As I completely uh, agree with that. I mentioned the example of the congestion charge earlier, which makes a surprising difference to the business case on whether it, it makes sense or doesn't make sense under some circumstances to, to run an EV fleet. I, I guess it might be uh, helpful if governments were perhaps just a little bit more honest sometimes in the way in which they you know, present policy to the public. It may just make it easier for all of us. So uh, I, I think often we're presented with targets that governments cling to that are clearly not going to be achieved and nobody wants to admit it um, until there's a change of government in which case a new government will come in and say well the old government messed up and the new targets now moved uh, or, or indeed uh, explaining why policies are coming in um, uh, and I don't want to be uh, political here but there is a, a new form of charging coming in in London who, whose name I won't uh, mention but if somebody simply said to me well we're putting our finger on the scales to make it more attractive to bring EVs into London I would be fine with that right I, I don't need a whole story about uh, other things that are um, scientifically contentious um, so I think sometimes it would just be helpful if governments uh, were just straightforward in what they're trying to achieve and and, and don't put time-based limits on what they're trying to see or go them, but 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 more about the percentage of EVs on the road or the or the amount of charging infrastructure and then work as quickly as they can towards that rather than kind of arbitrary dates that have been uh, that have been set and then will be forgotten about uh, Sam, I know um, uh, early on you were mentioning about the importance of infrastructure and that being a key challenge. I want to dig into that a little bit more. Um, infrastructure is everything. What do you see the big challenges are, Sam, and I'll start with you on this as something you referenced earlier. What are the big challenges facing the development of EV infrastructure and how are we actually going to address them? Mm, okay, that's a big question. Um, uh, I guess, firstly, um, depending on what stats you read, there's around 50% of the population don't have the, the luxury of off-street parking, right? So that's half of the population that, um, that, that have a, a need for public access for charging. And that's inherently more expensive at the moment than it is at home. So they, you know, it's like a double, double hit of, of a challenge. So um, there's, there's that element we need, we need to contend with as a, as a, as a collective industry and, and as government. Um, but then the similar, the practicality of the infrastructure and making sure that it's where it needs to be. Uh, it's sufficiently high powered so people can, can feel comfortable that there is the availability of charging and you'll get sufficient power when you, when you turn up and it's reliable. Uh, and it's affordable, so that it becomes a seamless, a seamless transition. Um, and as I said a couple of times now, it's not perfect, but we're, but we as again as a collective industry are are getting much, much, much better um, at being able to provide the solutions. But um, we are somewhat restricted by by power. So uh, it's not that there isn't enough power in this country. There is. It's about getting it in the right places, which is the great the the, the, the bit we've got to try and um, overcome. So. Our, we, we've got hundreds and hundreds of, of grid applications across the whole country, um, some of which are mobilising very quickly um, and some of them are 10 years away. Uh, in some cases in Cornwall, for example, you know, it's, it's, it's going to cost us <coughs> millions and millions of pounds to get the cable where it needs to be from the power source to the service station. So we've had to create uh, innovative ways of trying to mitigate that with local solar or local battery storage so that we can turn a 100 kilowatt supply into a megawatt supply, but only in the, for, the, for a demand response when people actually need it. And then we trickle charge for the rest of the time. So we're trying to come up with lots of different in innovative ways of, of, of local generation, as well as trying to find ways of, of hurrying people up a bit to, to enable us to get the grid upgrades that we need to be able to put the charges in the ground for the consumer to be able to use so there's, there's, there's you know it's multifaceted it's, and, it, and it is difficult um but we're getting there slowly but surely yeah so, so I, I mean i completely concur with, with, with that outside of my exciting life on optimized prime i do work with itachi on other uh, programs uh, as well and just to kind of give an example perhaps of some of the uh, the issues that others have, have faced i work with um uh, a company who will remain anonymous, anonymous but nonetheless they have a series of high-end retail villages uh, around europe um, and so the clientele that they tend to attract tend to be rather more moneyed um, and, um, and not short of an electric vehicle or two, let's put it that way. Um, and uh, this organisation had put in place about 20 EV charge stations uh, and they were offering free charging. Um, and uh, they, they ran the numbers on their total electricity bill and then worked out so how much of our electricity bill is gobbled up by the 20, it's not a huge number, 
20 EV charge points. It was something like 20% of their total electricity bill. Okay, so they introduce uh, charging um, for charging. Fair enough, a, a reasonable uh, economic uh, response. But nonetheless, they want to expand. Um, and they immediately run into the constraint that you mentioned, which is not that there isn't the power available, but actually getting it where you need it uh, was hard. And then you put in the application to the, to the local uh, distribution company, and you join the queue and you know, see you in five years kind of thing if you're lucky. Um, so they say, well, never mind. We're an entrepreneurial company. We can get around this because we're fortunate enough to own land. We can build our own solar farm. We can put in place commercial batteries. We will make this thing work and solve this, as we do other problems in retail, right? We, we're the kind of people that get shit done. Um, uh, except, of course, you try to do that, and then you run into endless you know, regulations and constraints and you know, see you in five years again, even though you're practically doing the whole thing yourself this time. So I, I do think, uh, perhaps thinking back to a previous question, there is a lot more that local government and central government could do to facilitate the rollout of infrastructure because it, it, is, it, it does feel, I think, for many organisations, like wading through treacle, right? and it's not fun. Peter? I think you touched on uh, reliability, actually. I think uh, I talked to my parents who've just shifted to an electric vehicle and they had range anxiety before buying their, their vehicle. And I think it's just be, be having something that's reliable. And I think when you travel to a petrol station, you could go down the M1, and you see the amount of petrol pumps compared to uh, electric charges, and you think, oh, actually, is that enough? But it, you know, it is getting better. And I think we speak from motorsports again, but, but our series is 100% uh, electric, and we go to places affected by climate change, so Chile, Argentina, Senegal, and we bring our own resources to charge vehicles. And the tech is there. The tech is there, and it's easy to do. Well, not easy to do. I've just made that up. It's very hard to do. Um, we make it look easy. Yeah. But, we, but we make it look easy, or the operations team do. Uh, but the tech is there, and I think that businesses and uh, governments need to see this as just, it's an opportunity. You know, you touched on retail parks. You know, could you put EV charges there to guarantee business? Could you give it to your staff to help them with uh, their carbon footprint or, or, or credit reliability or um, client retention? It's just, I think, if, if we all club together and understand everyone's tech, then it will get better and more reliable. Yeah, a key phrase you said there is range anxiety that your, your folks have, and the other one is, is charge anxiety. So range anxiety is diminishing now because the vehicles can go much further. Um, charge anxiety remains because the infrastructure, you know, is it going to work when I get there? Um, and there was, a, there was a lovely um, quote from, I think it was the um, former chairman of VW many years ago that said, I've got, a I've got a bladder range of about 200 miles. So that's as far as I can go before I want to stop anyway. Mm. Um, so providing infrastructure is, is supporting the times when I need to stop. That's all I've got to worry about. So I don't need a vehicle that goes 500 miles. It's not necessary. I mean, no one wants to drive that long and that far in one go anyway. So providing we can alleviate the range anxiety, which I think I think we've you know the, the OEMs have, have cracked that now in the automotive world, we just got to get that charge anxiety um, uh, diminished, mm -hmm. um, and then people can just you know graze and, and stop where they need to, um, and, and for s sort out their bladder range and actually you know kill two birds with one stone or three birds or four birds by doing your emails, checking, having a wee, have, having a coffee, charging your car, doing all these things at the same time then it becomes a non-event. You know, you're just on your way and with a few more hundred miles in your, in your battery, uh, which is kind of what I do now anyway. So we're getting there. Yeah. Bladder range, another highly technical term we can all <laughs> take away with us uh, today. Um, staying with sort of the business side of things, do we all feel more could be done by companies and businesses to accelerate their transition over to EV? Because the more business vehicles that are appearing on the roads that are EVs, that could maybe push the market and drag the market along with them. I'm seeing enthusiastic nodding from that end. Do you feel more could be done? Uh, well, I think quite a lot is being done. Uh, uh, people will forgive me if my, if my stat is a little bit out of date, but certainly when we looked at this on Optimise Prime in 2020, something like 60% of all new EV sales were for commercial fleets. So, uh, and, and I know that the appetite within commercial organisations to electrify their fleets has kind of you know, gone up and down pretty much with the, 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 their perceptions around the rollout of infrastructure and also the price of electricity and charging. Um, but I think, um, I think there is an appetite uh, amongst business uh, to do it. They're in the position uh, of more regularly than most consumers of having to renew their fleet, so the decision comes up more frequently. Um, and, and so I think the appetite is there, provided that some of the constraints that we've already spoken about uh, can, be, can be made to go away. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, and just I think just to add that, um, so the grid stuff has a sun to wheel mantra. So we've got we've got um, generation, distribution, and consumption. So we own solar farms, we own infrastructure, which we've mentioned, uh, but we also lease for electric vehicles and um, to the end consumer, which is the whole sun to wheel journey. Um, and, and that latter stage, we, we've we've started doing salary sacrifice products, and that's been hugely successful. Um, so that whole another element of the whole the whole um, fleet side um, is, is salary sacrifice for EVs, which is you know hugely hugely tax efficient for for the employee, uh, and that's been really really popular. So I think things are being done actually, rather mm -hmm. than it needs to be done. I think I think you know it is coming through. I think seventy percent now we're at actually. I think it's, it's crept up over the last few years in terms of that that particular stat. Yeah. So so yeah. It's it, it is definitely going the right way, and uh, I think we, we talk to a lot of sponsors, so Vodafone Business, Continental, and um, the really encouraging thing is that a lot of them don't see it as just the cost of business. They see it as a way to retain staff, or, and saying that actually if they would like to get um, younger people into their organisation, this generation coming through is caring about sustainability, caring about diversity and equality, and this kind of contributes to all that. So I think that the smart business I've heard don't just see it as a P&L point of view, they see it as a staff retention and a, an imaging point of view, which I think is really encouraging. When you say about an imaging point of view, do they feel it important to be going out and saying, well, we are encouraging our staff to drive EVs and use more sustainable or, or, you know, uh, options? Uh, I, absolutely yeah. that. Uh, we've done lots of research on our um, audience and the stat is that 42% 40, of our um, audience are more likely to buy from somebody who is seen as sustainable. I know that definition of seen as sustainable is a, is a debatable one, but mm. I do think that's ext extremely true. And I think that being seen to do the right thing in time helps with uh, conversion, longevity, and and uh, retention of uh, of customers. Well, yeah, sorry, I was about to say that seen to be doing the right thing. You're absolutely right, but also needing to do it now mm. is a prerequisite to, to win business. You know, that's, it's been the, been the case now for some time with um, CSR and ESG obligations, etc. That that that, that, that demonstrate the need to do this in order to win business so it's absolutely necessity now for businesses to be able to demonstrate that they're electrifying not because it's just because it's the right thing to do which it is of course it, it, it's that you know that might govern the, your, 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 your business might be the foundation of it and the, and the clients that you have might be based on your ability to demonstrate um, forward thinking in this space well i'll be wanting to look to the future a bit more in just a second but i will go to the room uh now for any questions um before i move on to that do we have any immediate questions uh from the room charlie is standing by with the mic uh i think the first hand was just down here at the front Charlie. if you just keep your hand up please just so charlie can find you thank you very much are we on we are um we touched upon government policy which is really interesting how important do you think it is that the government meets it's stated 2030 ice ban. I think there's rumours that it could be pushed back. And assuming it does come into place, do you have any concerns around an influx of EVs and the added pressure that that might put on the national grid? Uh, and if so, what kind of approaches and solutions do you think are needed to mitigate that? Um, for instance, smart charging has been positioned as um, a, viable, a viable way to, to respond to that. I'm happy to have a first uh, yeah. a first crack. So uh, I think I think as as a, as a principle, if you set a target, it's important that you really try to meet it. And I'm not sure that that is what's going on nationally at the moment. I think there's a lot of uh, people that are keen to get behind a slogan without doing all of the hard work uh, to, to make it happen. Uh, I think there probably are some. You, you hinted at some practical problems now of actually meeting the target, and I think that's true. And that's because a lot of the hard work should already have been done. Uh, and, and hasn't been done. Um, so, um, uh, so, so that'd be my, my, my initial response. Is I, I think government can do a lot by way of you know, creating the, the environment um, for things to happen, uh, making it easier for organisations to, uh, to to put in place infrastructure. But ultimately, I think it will come down uh, to private companies and their initiatives. Um, uh, and, and we can achieve a lot between now and 2030. Whether we'll achieve everything that people hope for, I'm a little sceptical. Um, yeah, I would just add, um, as per a previous point around the fact that we need clarity, you, know, you said rumours, um, which is the right word to use, uh, but that's, that's not what we want. We don't want rumours around, around legislation potentially shifting. Um, we, need, we need absolute concrete decisions and it need, absolutely needs to stay as a 2030 ban. In fact, I would, I would, as you might imagine, I'd argue that hybrids should also be part of that 2030 ban as well. 
uh, or bybrids as I like to call them, because um, they are an old generate old technology which now is no longer relevant. Um, but we definitely need um, we need that clarity for sure. Uh, but also 2030 is seven years away, and, and that will go in the blink of an eye. But at the same time, there's plenty of time to plan for it. You know, when we had the congestion charge, when there were ultra low emission zone, etc. You had the the, the 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 media bit just before it came into effect, waving their hands, going, well, we're, "What are we going to do?" Whereas actually, the smart money and the smart people didn't say a word because they planned for it. You know, there's plenty of time on, on all fleets and all cycles of fleets. For, for, for 2030 to be a position whereby they're able to make decisions now which will inform them and help guide them to when we get to that point so it's not like a doomsday 2030 and we're all in trouble because there are years and years for us all to plan together Anything you wanted to add or shall I return to the room? Um, I don't know too much about it so I'll pass back <laughs> to you I will carry on then uh, There were several other hands that went up I believe uh, just in the middle here and then I believe it was you with the, uh, with the spots Hi, um, I think we discussed about the different ways you can promote the adoption of EVs, but um, how is the, you know, the battery swapping as a concept, you know, is there a traction you can see or has there been any business case <coughs> around that? I'm going to defer to you on battery swapping. <laughs> yeah. For, for me, for, you know, I, I'm just trying to think of how polite to answer the question. Uh, no, I think is the answer, for me at least. Um, the, the the concept of battery swapping is very you know engineering wise that's a complex thing to do you've got to move around a lot of batteries you need to have all the infrastructure to support battery swapping you need all the automotive oems to create some degree of universality otherwise it's never going to work so you're looking at uh, potentially uh, you know an infrastructure or, or an entire market that's going to cost billions of pounds to set up only for electric vehicles to be able to do three four five hundred miles range in the next five years anyway thus negating the point of the, the batch swapping the batteries in the first place because um, there was an article with Fully Charged a couple of years ago with battery swapping in China where the, where, where the, the chap um, over there, Elliot, was, was talking about it and the fact that you can change a battery in four minutes, but he had to wait an hour for his booking slot, which I thought was quite ironic because it was actually an hour and four minutes he had to wait, by which point he could have easily easily charged his vehicle up and be on his way. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think in certain... I don't know, maybe motorbikes or scooters or something. It'd be quite a, as it as it is in the in the pedal assist world now, quite a convenient thing to be able to take a battery and swap it with another one. But for me personally, in the in the in the larger vehicle world, I just think that's it, it's kind of like a nice idea. But the, the technology will just evolve to the point where we don't need it. That's my view. Uh, from performance point of view, I'm not a fan. Uh, you, you can swap uh, batteries in and out. We've tried it. Um, I just don't like it. <laughs> well, that's what I should have said. It's yeah. much easier. <laughs> Next time, be blunter. That's fine. <laughs> At the risk of introducing a spurious anecdote, but building on your point around the difficulties of standardisation, one of the curses we had on the Optimized Prime program was we needed to uh, download charging data, uh, and so you need to build a software protocol to interact with uh, literally the socket and the prog and extract data, right? Um, and it's a little bit of a nuisance to do, but you think, well, once we've done it for the, for the eight or so different protocols that there are, then we've done it for the trial, right? We ended up with over 40 because the, 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 the car manufacturers kept on changing it gratuitously, as far as we were concerned, and certainly in a non-standard fashion. So bringing all that lot together for something more serious like battery swapping, good luck with that. Yeah, I mean, there might be some use cases, right? I mean, in the bus world, you know, in the same way that hydrogen is not going to be the solution for transport, but there might be niches whereby it actually does work, uh, whether that be in, you know, I don't know, in, in, in aviation, for example, or, yeah. or in, in buses for, for battery swap. You know, there might be niches whereby, and, and large niches, you know, cause it, because the because it's, it's a metronomic, metronomic movement of a vehicle that does the same thing every day, and maybe it's cheaper to have a vehicle with a very small battery and be able to swap it out. So, you know, I think yeah, that's probably applications for all this innovation, but mainstream, I don't, I don't see it. Yeah, it's, it's important to play devil's advocate on some of these things. There's, it's good there's innovation, there's good there's ideas, and it's finding the right, the right yeah. spot for them. Uh, thank you for that question. We have a, another question there just there. It's Amy, I'm an independent consultant with a travel and transport background. Firstly, really enjoyed the panel today. Um, my question sticks with this theme of innovation and batteries. The panel mentioned lithium earlier, and I wondered if you had any views on what emerging innovation you're seeing um, in relation to batteries and how you think that may um, impact the market. We're looking at you. Look at me again. Uh, okay, well, one thing springs to mind is, is not lithium but cobalt. Um, so obviously that's, that's a... Uh, uh, contentious subject in regards to the way in which that's been mined in, in, in the past and, and we've seen um, 
huge uh, initiatives um, within the global market to reduce that um, to the point now where certain Tesla models, for example, are cobalt-free batteries. Whereas what people often forget is that cobalt is used in the refining of petrol and diesel and has done for, for decades. Um, so it's not just all about the EVs that, that are uh, um, a, a, a child mining and all those horrible things that are associated with cobalt mining, which therefore it's all, it's all the EVs fault, which of course it isn't. Um, but that's one innovation where we can see that um, that, that type of um, rare earth metal or, or, or valuable thing um, needs, needs to be in petrol and diesel or needs to be in the process of it. It doesn't need to be in vehicles, electric vehicles, and we're already starting to see innovation to, to move that away so, um, or, or eradicate it completely. Um, so that's one sort of example, I guess, of, of, of an innovative approach in, in finding ways to, uh, to, to take away the, those elements and minerals that we don't actually need in, in, the, in the building of the uh, batteries. And then there's also a huge amount of innovation in the recycling of batteries as well. Another myth is that you know, they, it's gonna, they're going to break down after three years like my mobile phone does, and I'm going to have to spend eight grand fixing it or whatever, which is total nonsense. The vehicle rigidity and strength and the innovation in these batteries is, is huge. Uh, and even when they do start to, to, to reach their natural conclusion in somewhere between f probably 10 years from now in a vehicle, they can still be used for, for battery storage for, for another decade after that. And then they can be recycled, broken down, and then reused. For, and the innovation will have advanced tremendously by the point in which that these batteries are actually then, at this point, 20 or 30 years old, then get repurposed, reused, and then put back into batteries again. So um, I think we're seeing loads and loads of good innovation in the space that's, 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 uh, that's helping our cause. Yeah, I, I was just going to mention cobalt as well and I think a lot of people say about mining and I think the encouragement from a lot of um, policy makers and governments is to make mining sustainable because a lot of things that we need are, are, are taken from the earth itself and we're working for, with a, a copper mine in uh, Chile called Antofagasta and it's about helping them electrolyze their fleet of vehicles to make sure that mining is sustainable but also we're putting a project about for every hectare that is mined they rewild three hectares uh, within uh, Chile itself so it's about encouraging sustainable mining and also another bit of tech is that there is a world where hydrogen potentially powers electric vehicles so an electric motor powered by liquid hydrogen which uh, is coming however the issues of transporting hydrogen storing hydrogen safely uh, hasn't been negated yet so that is another bit of tech that could be coming down the line Martin, anything to add on that final word? Uh, no, I think you've uh, you've been definitive on cobalt and uh, alternatives. Well, thank okay. you. Well, I think that wraps us up nicely for time as well. Thank you very much. We have we have one last question at the front here, Charlie. If you're still there, if we can keep this uh, to the point, it'd be appreciated because it is the lunch break next. Is it a yes/no question. <laughs> Hi, I'm from uh, Mighty, and um, for the record, we've got like one of the biggest uh, EV fleet in the country. So something to be proud about as very far good. as we're concerned. And my question is probably to Martin uh, with regards to uh, when we talk about the EV infrastructure and everything and the range as well, we look at the small vehicle, uh, small vans and all of that. What about the, um, maybe bigger trucks, for example? Is that something your research kind of like focused on by any chance? Uh, sadly not, and the, the reason for that was at the time, so the programme started in 2018, and in order to have enough vehicles coming from fleets that we could do uh, in business with, as it were, uh, we needed to, to kind of focus on smaller vehicles, hence Royal Mail, hence British Gas, hence Uber. It, it would have been very interesting and now much more possible to work on larger vehicles. Um, so I will be writing to His Majesty to see if he's got more money to allow us to do Optimize Prime 2 or whatever funky name we cook up uh, for the continuation. But sadly, I can't help you with data on that one. The return of Optimize Prime. There you go. Uh, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll do the voice for the trailer, don't worry. Yeah, I, think I will I say, though, is um, uh, there's definitely... Um uh, innovation coming in the in the larger larger space. I mean, we've got um, the likes of uh, Volvo, Scania, DAF, Mercedes, Renault trucks. They're all building 40 to 44 ton electric commercial vehicles now that can pull huge loads and travel huge distances. And and part of my role within Grid Service to find a solution for that infrastructure. So we've got something for cars now, and it's growing all the time. But now we need the solution that covers those larger vehicles too. So uh, so there's definitely lots and lots of vehicles out there that are that are over and above the sort of car derived van. Um, but you know, already Volvo. Are producing um, of a production line of 40 to 44 tonne electric tractor units, so it's coming. Okay, Martin, Sam, Peter, thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed your company. Thank you.